Hello, and welcome to Jack Chat, presented by the Journal of Athletic Training, the official journal of the National Athletic Trainers Association. I'm Dr. Kara Radzak, an assistant professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and we're all coming to you from our homes. So right now, there could be interruptions due to children, animals, pets, or the neighbors. So please um, take that into consideration. The purpose of today's event is to provide an open forum for athletic trainers and other healthcare professionals to learn a little bit more about the recently published consensus statement and companion manuscript regarding best practices for pre-hospital care of the injured athlete with a suspected catastrophic cervical spine injury. Today, I'm joined by a few of the manuscript's authors, Mr. Ron Corson, Dr. Brianna Mills, Dr. Jim Ellis, and Dr. Stanley Herring. Thank you all so much for joining me today. At this point, I would like to introduce Ron, Jim, Stan, and Brianna, um, and give us a little bit of introduction of what your current position is and what your role on these manuscripts was. Ron, let's start with you. Thanks, Kara. Um, I currently serve as Director of Sports Medicine at the University of Georgia. I've been here the past 25 years, and I served as co-chair with the Spine Injury Support Group along with Jim and Stan. Jim, tell us some more about yourself. Yes, thank you, Kara. I uh, also was a co-chair, like Ron said, with Ron and Stan. I'm an emergency physician by training. Um, I work clinically in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, and I have a long affiliation uh, as an emergency physician, the emergency care of the athlete, uh, former team physician with the Atlanta Falcons, and uh, was recently asked to be the emergency preparedness consultant to the National Football League. Thank you. Now let's move to the West Coast. Tell us more about yourself, Stan and Brianna. I'll go first. Uh, age before knowledge. Let's do it that way. Uh, <laughs> I am a uh, clinical professor at the University of Washington. And along with Jim and Ron, I had the privilege of being part of the coordinating group for this, these efforts. Um, I'm a physiatrist by training, um, have a particular interest in spine injury and concussion. I'm one of the team physicians for the Seahawks and the Mariners. I'm a co-founder of the Sports Institute at UW Medicine and spend quite a bit of my time taking care of athletes with suspected spine injury. Thank you. Hi. Um, <laughs> it's hard to go after Stan sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I am a research scientist at the Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center here at University of Washington and a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology. Um, I led the systematic review that um, formed sort of the evidence base for the consensus statement. Um, and I'm, I'm first author on the consensus statement, which means I uh, got to incorporate all of the lovely opinions of my, my 23 co-authors into what I hope is a cohesive document. I can confirm with you, it is a very cohesive document. This was, um, it is chocked full with wonderful information, these two manuscripts that are going to be very, very valuable to all the clinicians out there. And um, thank you guys all so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Brianna, can you give us a little bit more information on the process of how the consensus statement came together? Sure. Uh, it was a labor of, uh, well, we'll just, we'll call it love. Um, <laughs> we started off with um, a nominal group technique, um, which incorporates what we commonly call the Delphi method. Um, we spent several months um, working with the participants in the spine injury and sport group to really uh, figure out what questions people wanted to answer and, uh, you know, exactly how we were going to start answering those questions. Um, and we turned that into the systematic review criteria. And then uh, my team and myself uh, screened 1,500 scientific titles, reviewed 800 abstracts, and summarized the results of uh, just about 50 full-text studies into the systematic review, which we then... Uh, took with us to a two-day meeting where we locked ourselves in a room for two days and uh, came out with uh, the, the consensus conclusions and recommendations that are in the document. No blood was spilled. <laughs> That's good to hear. 
<laughs> so um, will one of you guys tell us a little bit more about the spine injury and sport group. Um, one of the things that was mentioned in the consensus statement was that it was formed after the 2015 Inner Association Task Force on Pre-Hospital Care for the Sports Injury a spine athlete. Um, how did this, tell us more about this group and how it played a role in the consensus statement. Well, how we started out in 2015, we put together the uh, consensus statement group and we had actually 14 different governing bodies involved in that. And we worked really hard for two years, but unfortunately we could not reach a consensus, which happens sometimes in a very complex situation. And uh, throughout the time, there's some fundamental changes in, in the EMS care as well related to spine. So we decided to start over and take a different tack. And rather than trying to get professional organizations involved, we tried to get uh, the, the most qualified people we could. So we selected 25 people in a wide variety of specialties, from researchers to uh, various physician specialties to uh, paramedics, to athlete trainers. And uh, we had over 200 years of clinical experience in that group of 25 people. And we decided, let's try to take more of a systematic look with the Delphi process and one of the things we rapidly found out, too, is uh, we want to try to make it efforts based but there's some areas we just don't have enough scientific research. So we decided to write actually two papers, one the Delphi study, efforts based and then the best practice more from a healthcare options concept. Great. Thank you. So please provide a little bit more of uh, what was your goal of this project and who's your intended audience for these two manuscripts? Yeah, I'll... Uh, I'll take the first stab at that if I can. Um, the goal was to look at what the research really showed. Um, I think in the past, a lot of people were working off of certain assumptions that they may have had passed down over the years and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of thought around what was the appropriate care to spine injured athlete. But we really wanted to look at what was out there in the literature, what wasn't out there in the literature, and come up with a consensus document that was really, really proven in the literature, which was the beautiful thing about the Delphi process. And the group that Ron and, and San and I put together was specifically related to making sure that we had physicians, which included team physicians, orthopedic surgeons, physiatrists like Stan, emergency physicians like myself, and just physicians that were going to be around these athletes, neurosurgeons, and then also athletic trainers that had been functioning at a very high level, but also some athletic trainers that were maybe at the high school level that could understand mm -hmm. what that looked like. And then, of course, you know, having EMS and, and paramedics involved was, was critical. So we just knew that the, that the scope was not just the, the uh, care team for the athlete on the field of play or at practice, but it was also going into the emergency department and possibly going into surgery for a, a spine case that needs to go to the OR. So that was the broad, broad group that we put together. And it was interesting, uh, like Brianna said, to get all those people in the room. And um, I kind of volunteered to, to Ron and Stan to get up there at the very beginning and read them the riot act and said, you know, you need to check your ego at the door because we need to come out with consensus of this. And uh, it, it was difficult, but it was an amazing experience. And I, and I thank everyone on this, this group for making that happen. Thank you. Um, one of the things that's really, I found unique um, about this consensus statement is you kind of went and identified some questions and then really dug into the research and using the questions to base the consensus statement off of. Give us a little bit more um, background for those viewers that might not have read the, the manuscript yet. What were some of your questions that you were asking? I think Brianna should be the one to answer that since she's the one who challenged us to find the questions. Um, yes, and how was that developed? Right. Yeah. Right. To, to, set, to set the stage for her, um, part of the Delphi process involved taking your potential group of writers and querying them about areas they think is important, that they think are important, and trying to develop um, questions around that that may be answered by comprehensive and systematic review. Brianna, did I get that close to being correct? Yes. Yes, you did. Um, so, you know, we were brought in, the, my team at, at the Injury Center were brought in really to help figure out how to get people to agree. Um, and, and we started really with, all right, the best way to get people to agree is to start with things that they already agree on. Um, and for us, that meant 
you know, before we can figure out what the answers are, we have to agree on what the questions are. Mm -hmm. And so we started just with asking people, you know, what are the questions that are important to you? Um, And the answers we got back, we sort of read through and refined and sent them back out and said, okay, here's what we're hearing. These are the questions, you know, do these make sense to you? Um, Does the wording make sense? And how broadly should we be asking these questions? Because, you know, people had some, some great questions, but we really needed to, to focus on a, on a population and talk about how we were going to define the group of athletes that we wanted to, to talk about. Um, And that was kind of the foundation of the review was agreeing. Okay. It's not necessarily just football and it's not all sports that have ever been played because, you know, You'd be surprised, but there's a couple articles out there about surfing related injuries. Yep. Um, so we focused really on, um, you know, catastrophic cervical spine injuries that involved um, shoulder pads and face masks and helmets. Um, and once we got people sort of to agree on the topic we were talking about, it's a lot easier than to have a conversation and know that what I think I'm saying to you and what you're saying to me, we're actually talking about the same idea. Great. Thank you. Um, And one of the things that I noticed was that you guys did a really good job of breaking apart the differences um, between sports that were equipment intensive. So what were some of the sport specific uh, considerations that need to be made regarding equipment and equipment removal that you reached a consensus on? That's that's a great point. One of the things we tried to do with equipment removal is recognize that there's, there's different variables. And we all know it has to be removed at some point, but there's differences on when it has to be removed. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can very easily be removed in the ED as it has been in the past. It can move on the field of play. And a lot of it's based on the individual scenarios in that situation. You know, for example, if you have somebody respiratory compromise or cardiac arrest, obviously the equipment has to be removed immediately so we, you can administer life support measures. Um, but one of the biggest things we want to emphasize is, you know, knowing that it has to be removed, what the best things to do with that, and how can we educate everybody across the board? Um, many times athletic trainers are the most familiar with equipment, but they may not be in the emergency room with people who aren't very familiar with it. So what's the best way to, to try to teach them? So we, we try to make it more healthcare options. And again, recognize there's more than one way to, to skin a cat. So mm-hmm. uh, you know, come up with different scenarios and based on the circumstance you have with the athlete, you can make decisions on where the best way to remove it is. Cara, I, I think that um, part of the process and, and part of uh, the Delphi process does not allow the loudest voice to win. So people were able to express their ideas in an anonymous fashion and ideas could be brought forward. And I think that we learned a few things. I think we learned that there's more than one right answer. Mm-hmm. If, if the, I think the most valuable thing for me from this was we need to understand that medical status of the athlete, the type of equipment and resources available on the field as well as in the emergency room all dictate what may be the best for that athlete. And that changes in each circumstance, which really speaks to the critical importance of the emergency medical action plan in the medical timeout before the game. That was a real win for this group. I think it's a win for those who look at this paper. Uh, the key here, and I think uh, Everybody and all 25 authors were clearly motivated to do what's best for the athlete. And what this group realized was that there are different equipment removal techniques, different transfer techniques, and when and how and where those are to be done really depends upon the uh, details of the circumstance particular to that injury. Mm -hmm. If you use that as a foundation, then it does set the stage for further research. And I I, I think that was, this was really consensus building at its very best. And I think that's what came through loud and clear in this, uh, in this effort. Thank you. And Stan, you, you touched on that, the medical timeout. Can you give us a little bit and can all of you guys give us a little bit more information on what kind of constitutes best practices for that medical timeout developing that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say and go ahead, and then I'll follow up. Now, why don't you go ahead and we'll do it correctly? 
no, it's just that's it's always always been one of the things that I'm focused on. And, um, you know, it's just a critical component because I think we we've discussed it, you know, before before games. Mm -hmm. But do you do it before practice? And if you look at a number of incidences over the last you know, few years, not just with spine injury, but probably most importantly with spine injury, having that medical time out before a game, before a practice, you talk about the different conditions, what's changed, different personnel may be there than were there yesterday. If someone's out, if someone's sick, if you're, you know, on a college campus, have they closed down a road, you know, and so the best way to get EMS in or EMS out, particularly for a spine injured athlete when the timing is so critical for them to get to the correct appropriate facility a level one level two trauma center mm -hmm. that can handle that spine injured patient it's just critical to have the medical time out before any event um, we practice all the time uh, we have games relatively infrequently for most sports cer certainly for football and so we just thought it was a critical thing to stress that medical time out have the discussion of how someone will be packaged, how someone will be taken care of, how they will be immobilized, and then where will they end up, again, particularly going to a level one or level two trauma center that can handle, if appropriate and if available, uh, to a patient that can get them to the OR as quickly as possible if they have a surgical spine injury that requires operative repair. So we, we just thought that was critical in the whole process. Thank you, Jim. And who do you guys recommend being involved in this medical timeout? You mentioned a few people, but who as athletic trainers um, and medical professionals who are probably in the process of reevaluating what they're going to do going into the star of sports again, who should they be considering um, being in those medical timeouts? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the situation. If you look at a uh you know, a professional uh, or a, a division one college football game, there are a lot of personnel there. So you're going to have your athletic trainers, you're going to have your team physicians, you'll have EMS. So anyone that is the, the group that encircles the athlete and is part of the entire team. Mm -hmm. If it's at a, you know, a high school practice um, and there's a single athletic trainer there, I mean, they may need to have the medical time out with a head coach or they may have the medical time out with someone else that's there that will be their workforce. How are we going to initiate a call to 911? Um, not just for a C-spine injured athlete, but who's going to run get the AED if I'm the only athletic trainer on the field of play and I didn't bring it out when I came out. So we just think the medical timeout is with whoever the workforce is to take care of an athlete at a game uh, are out of practice, but but everyone that is surrounding the athlete at that time, which can be coaches at, at certain levels. One point too, Kara, if you're in a competition, try to involve the officials as well, just from a scene control standpoint. You know, if you have a event on the field of play, keeping the athletes back in the box will clear the area for the EMS and the athlete trains to work. So I think it, involving the officials as well. And, you know, Cara, this is a witnessed event with a potentially catastrophic outcome. And so anyone who's going to be involved in any fashion needs to be uh, part of this medical timeout. And roles and responsibilities need to be clearly defined. It is not time when you are hovering over the athlete with the visiting team to ask who's in charge of the rescue mm -hmm. or what equipment that they have. And, and talking about it is one thing. And one thing that we've learned from Jim and Ron is that this is really – the implementation of a well-rehearsed and well-practiced EAP. You're setting me up perfectly. Let's go into practicing. Let's go into training. What do you guys recommend? What consensus was um, reached on how often, how training should be done? You know, um, let me brag on my two co-directors here. I mean, this is obviously Ron's last work, and Jim is, is responsible for setting up EAPs for the last 20-plus Super Bowls and a variety of other potential mass casualty events. Um, what the, the, I think the best practices paper, the companion paper to the evidence-based piece, uh, evidence -based piece that Brianna shared, touches on it a bit. Um, I mean, it is clear that that emergency action plans need to be written, venue specific, rehearsed, mm -hmm. and practiced in real time. Hopefully that serves as a springboard for 
for healthcare teams to practice EAPs when things go wrong. So practice for complications, practice in different environments, different locations on the field. Uh, it's a perishable skill. And one fertile area, I think, that, that this work has demonstrated, it would be very interesting for further research to look and see what is retention among participants, how well is that knowledge maintained, and what is execution skill, and what is transfer skill. There's a lot here. What's the best method of purveying that information? Hopefully, the, this type of work will encourage people to think about research opportunities. This would be on the educational and execution side. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of work here that can be made to maximize the effectiveness. And all of us, any of us who have been involved in this, you know, it's never what you think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And the more you practice and the more scenarios you practice, and as Ron likes to say, calm is contagious. Uh, This is such a critically important part of this for a witness rescue. I think Stan raised a great point is making your uh, EAP, your rehearsal scenario base. So try to simulate, you know, what what can't go wrong. You know, for example, you you know, practice in a confined space environment where maybe you have an athlete up against a wall where you may modify your technique. Or, you know, uh, what's going to happen if they go into cardiac arrest in the middle of the uh, mobilization procedure? So try to think about what's the worst thing that can happen and work those scenarios. If you can work through that, then you're ready to go. Thank you. Any other suggestions on developing or as people are reassessing their EAPs right now, things to look at? Yeah, I I think that, you know, we we talked about before, um, you know, all the changes. Um, and, and we do think anytime you write a consensus paper, you're making sure that you look at history and, and what's been done. And if there are any changes, then people need to rehearse that. If you've never removed equipment on the field of play before, that's not the first time to do it. It has to be when you practice it in the preseason. And that's why we've always been big advocates of scenario-based training, not just talking mm-hmm. about it, but actually doing it and practicing it. And it's always been annually, and and we had some discussions around should there, you know, be a recommended recommendation to a semi annually. I think it should be annually, but also if you have a need to update, um, just say you you've changed your your training staff, your medical staff, or you've got a different EMS crew, or whatever it may be, then it may be at least annually, but more often if if things dictate. And you know, I think particularly with the COVID world going on right now, again, not within the auspices of this paper, but I think all of us that are involved in football are, con- you know, right now just particularly worried about the deconditioned athlete. Again, not within the scope of what we're talking about here, but, you know, that's another reason to focus, focus that coming into training camp for a lot of teams that are going to be, you know, hitting hitting the, you know, field in the next few weeks. I, I just think that'll be a, a huge thing. And again, all part of the EAP. Mm-hmm. Jim raised a great point, too, involving EMS. I think as athletic trainers, you know, typically write the emergency action plan, make sure EMS is involved. The, the first call we're going to make is the 911. So it makes sense to make sure they're involved in the components of the plan and also know what their local protocols are. There's some variability in different types of equipment that ambulance may carry and variability in protocols. So making sure that your protocol matches theirs. So, again, you don't get to a emergency situation. You have a conflict on the field of play. You, you worked out in advance. And Kari, you know, everybody has a camera phone, so record it, do it in real time and play it back and watch it. Don't just assume that you know each step. Go mm-hmm. through a scenario in real time, all the steps, and then play it back and, and see where uh, there may be an opportunity for improvement. Wonderful suggestions. Thank you guys so much. Um, another thing that came out with the consensus statement that was kind of not really surprising, but again, you it was also surprising is that some of your questions ranged from only having nine articles to help support the evidence to having zero. So can you give us a little bit of background on areas that in in the author's opinions were really they're undervaluated? And you kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, Stan, but what areas need to be um, looked into and researched more? Dr. Mills, where did you find nothing for us to review? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, not every question is going to have a scientific study answer. Uh, that's that's part of the reason why we did the Delphi is so that we could draw on the information and the DD expertise and the experience, uh, you know, of the spine injury and sport group. But having said that, 
Um, I wouldn't be a very good scientist if I told you that we were done asking questions, that we had found all the information that we needed to find on, you know, almost any topic. Um, so I think there's a couple key areas that um, I was surprised we didn't find as much. You know, mm-hmm. certainly we tried to make this about equipment intensive sports. And the majority of what we found was about American tackle football. Um, and how well that relates to um, to ice hockey or lacrosse or other sports, you know, I would guess, you know, we need to do more work there. Um, I think the other real key area is that, you know, athletes come in all shapes and sizes and ages. And a lot of the, what we found was based on, you know, college aged male football players. Um, how things need to change when you're dealing with younger athletes, uh, female athletes. Um, that's really an open question, but there's, there's a lot of work to be done. So, uh, if anything, it's just, you know, let's put some money into it and I think we can find some answers. Thank you. Anything that you guys, um, found interesting that you would like to see more research on? You already mentioned Stan, the, um, evaluating the training and retention. And there's to echo what Rihanna was saying. I mean, nothing runs enthusiasm like further follow-up. I mean, we, <laughs> we, we, we think we know what we're doing, right? Until someone like Rihanna comes and actually questions us about it and shows us that we're, there, there's not a lot of data. Now, listen, you know, evidence-based medicine is really the integration of clinical experience and research. So there's not the clinical experience in this space is incredibly important. Mm-hmm. There, there is no substitute for the number of years that Ron has been on the football field. No substitute for that. So you have to respect that. But then, you know, we really don't know how much motion is clinically relevant with different transfer techniques. We don't really know how much you can put axial traction on a cervical spine and straighten out a a head on the neck if necessary. I mean, we sort of do those things, but we don't know them. So given technological advancements, you know, with, with sensors and other, te- and, and other simulation technology, those things can probably be better studied. Uh, we can recruit colleagues who often may pronounce often are not in this space, biomedical engineers and others to work with this. So I think there's a lot of the technical aspects of the transfer that um, can be um, improved upon with bench work. But to uh, reiterate, I think there's still a lot of work to do to see how effective we can teach and maintain the medical timeout and the implementation of the EAP. And that's, that's low-lying fruit, low-hanging fruit, but critically important. Yeah, I'd agree. It was, it was kind of a, a, a difficult thing, particularly when we got the first group together because we were focusing a lot on spinal motion restriction and all the studies you're dealing with are, are cadaver studies and you go in and you cut the ant- ant- anterior longitudinal ligament, and just try to give a guess as to what happens. And it's, it's just not a, a great comparison, but it's the best that we had at the time. So there was a reason why we didn't get into it. And, and everyone knows that the more you restrict the motion, the better, the safer, but there, there are no studies to say, if you do this, then this will be the effect of that. And th- that's just the difficulty with the whole thing. And what's the best technique? Uh, there just haven't been that many outcomes that you can study and look at and say, oh, why did this happen? Because this was done. So. Thank you guys so much. Um, now, as we start wrapping up, I do want to talk about those athletic trainers that might not be in a Division One setting. What what are some good takeaway messages for that secondary school athletic trainer that's the sole athletic trainer at their high school and potentially at even a sporting event? What recommendations do you really feel like could help them? That's, that's a great point. That was one of the things we tried to make this as, as well as we could to address options. Because, you know, uh, my scenario where I'm at at University of Georgia or where uh, Stan may be at the Seattle Seahawks is much different than a high school athletic trainer. Um, if you're the only athletic trainer there, um, it may be that you're not going to try to do any you know, immobilization techniques on, on a spinal motion restriction until the parents get there. You're going to work together with them. 
The same thing, you're probably going to try to move equipment on the on the field of play because you don't have the, the number of properly trained personnel. So, you know, uh, finding out what you can do in that situation. And the most important thing is to prevent further harm. So mobilize them, package them appropriately, and then transport to the ED. But knowing that, you know, the equipment has to come off at some point, so communicate with your local ED. And it may be that you do a, a training and service with your emergency department if you know that you're going to transport with that athlete. So train them to help you do that on the field of play. Um, making sure if you're the only one there, what are my other options? You know, I may have a, a high school athletic training student. I may have some coaches that I can, I can train to help. And again, not trying to make them emergency personnel, but, you know, uh, for example, helping with the 911 call, retrieving the equipment, uh, various things they can do in a safe manner and simply take some education and training. So try to anticipate the scenarios you're going to have and what can you do on the advancing to try to, you know, uh, train your personnel to help with that. And I think that's one of the reasons why, too, we, we pulled together the companion video. And, and again, thanks to Stan and Brianna and everyone at the University of Washington for helping us out with that. So, you know, we tried as best we could demonstrate some techniques that required fewer people. Uh, and having uh, been on the field of play and, and covered a high school football game where there was a spine injured athlete, and it was myself and, and one athletic trainer, we we're fortunate that we did have EMS there. Uh, but that was not the exact crew that we had practiced EMS with in, in the preseason. So we didn't really know what they knew. We we'd also had recruited some coaches. And so we had pre-planned for coaches to be some of the, the workforce and the lifting help. So again, in those situations, you've got to use who, who you use. I mean, I was, you know, in the community enough where I knew where the, the doctors and nurses were in the stands if we needed other people. But again, you, you've got to use your resource as well, particularly if you're that solo athletic trainer uh just it puts you in a tough spot if you don't know who your resources are you know car we hope that the two papers and the companion video give this potential injury the gravity that it deserves so if you are an athletic trainer in high school you can take these materials and say look this is the highest level of of uh, scientific review it's a systematic review combined with a practical piece in a video because this is really important. And if I am your athletic trainer at your high school, we need to get this right. And we have to practice this. And this is an introduction to developing an EAP saying, you know, 25 experts from all different disciplines got together and used scientific rigor. And this is important. And the NATA thinks this is important in every organization that, that Jim and I and Ron belong to. It's a sports medicine organization thinks that this is important. So I, I hope that it allows some weight to this so that athletic trainer has a resource to take to a school to help implement policy. Thank you all. And you guys brought up that there's other resources, that it's not just these two manuscripts, that there's the appendices and there's videos. It's a really rich database for people to utilize. And um at this point in time, as we're starting to wrap up, Brianna, can you give us a little bit more background on what was your takeaway from working with all of these wonderful individuals and having to navigate all of the personalities? <laughs> you know, it's it's been a real pleasure. And, and I say that not just because it's the politically correct answer, <laughs> but because, you know, they've been working on this for decades. Um, and so has everyone else in that room. They had so many types of expertise and experience that my team just came in and we are trying to be the objective, neutral third party saying, here's what the science says. Um, and they put a lot of trust in us and uh, gave very generously of their time. Um, and often, you know, I, I hope it was it was a positive experience because it was a very welcoming one for Injury Center. You made us better. No, no. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll echo all that. And and again, um, having never been through the process like that, um, some of it was respect the process because those of us that didn't know anything about it, we, we kind of had to respect the process. But it really also came down to an extent to respecting the people because Brianna and her team had been through this before and done this so often before. Uh, I think it um, engendered a lot of confidence from the rest of us 
wow, they really know what they're doing. And, and even though there were times when she was kind of pushing us, um, <laughs> it was incredibly well received and very thoughtful. And her expertise just really carried the day, honestly. Thank you. And I would be completely amiss to not ask the three of y'all, um, what are your, give us a clinical pearl. Um, it could be about this. It could be about clinical um, life in general, just a clinical, per, a clinical pearl that all of those, especially young professionals out there would really appreciate hearing. I think one thing that came out of this is the importance of having a C-spine protocol. Um, you know, this was a common aspect with concussions a few years ago when having everybody actually write a, a protocol that you agree on. And, you know, with such, such an injury of this magnitude, you get everybody on the same page with your EMS, with your mm-hmm. physician, and with your neurosurgeon or orthopedic, write a protocol before it happens. Because, again, there's more than one way to do it. There's not one way. There's more than one right way. So deciding among your team what you want to do beforehand can solve a lot of problems down the road. So I think it's really important to emphasize writing a, a C-spine protocol. And that's one of the things we try to do too with the, with the links is we have some examples of C-spine protocols, emergency action plans, and medical timeouts. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can take, take a template and modify to your needs. Thank you, Ron. Jim? Yeah, for me, uh, you know, um, Stan is very kind and he talked about it being mine and Ron's life work. Um, and I appreciate that. The, 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 really the entire emergency action planning process, you know, would also be included. I, I feel like at least something I've tried to contribute to. And I've been, I've been giving lectures for 25 years on, on the EAP process and everything else. And, you know, I've, had a number of cases that I've either been involved with or reviewed or taken a look at. And just if, if there were missteps along the way, it tend to be, you didn't plan for worst case scenario. And one of the be- beautiful things about this process, it just really shines the light on how important it is to have a very specific process. Could be a number of different protocols, could be a number of different scenarios that they're utilizing to take care of a spine injured athlete but to make sure you know how to properly take care of them and get them to the nearest appropriate facility that can take care of that injury and give them the best chance, A, for survival, and and B, hopefully to walk again. And that doesn't happen every single time, but the sooner they can get to the appropriate facility, the sooner they can go to the EOR if they need to go to the EOR. It's just such a critical component, and and this process really – you know, was allowed us to emphasize that and practice, practice, practice what we've all heard about EAPs forever. Practice, practice, practice. All right. Um, having done this for almost four decades now. <laughs> You're um, dating yourself, man. I am. Uh, it was just the first hundred years that were the hardest. The um, <laughs> um, I was stunned at how much I learned about equipment removal from Ron and Jim, particularly from Ron. Techniques that we thought were just uh, written in stone, uh, Ron came and knocked the rock over. And so even this video taught us to be better at equipment removal. That's one direct thing I learned after all this time from the, from this process. And the second clinical pearl, I guess, is you should be careful about making policy based on things that you think are right versus what you know is right. That's my clinical pearl. Wow. That's powerful. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, It was a pleasure talking with you guys. There was a lot of brain power on this chat chat. And I really appreciate you taking your time. Um, Everybody who... um, is listening. Um, This is a wonderful piece and companion piece. And there's so much great information that you guys have generously supplied in the supplementals. So, and this is all available free of charge thanks to the National Athletic Trainers Association. Um, So please go out there and utilize this, uh, this wonderful resource. Again, thank you so much for joining me today, Ron, Brianna, Jim, and Stan. I greatly appreciate your efforts on this project, and thank you for talking with me. Thank Thank you. you. Yeah, thanks for having me.